The Legend of Zelda. There's really no reason for an introduction here. Everyone knows Zelda, one of the most beloved and storied franchises in all of gaming. The Legend of Zelda has been going strong for nearly 35 years at this point, with no signs of stopping anytime soon. With a series as big as Zelda, with more than a quarter of a century under its belt, how does Nintendo not only keep up the quality of the games they produce, but also remain fresh? Well, we all know about what Breath of the Wild did for not only the series, but the entire games industry, but Nintendo was also experimenting with this series for one particular entry in the franchise over 15 years ago. As I stated in my Super Mario Sunshine video, I find Nintendo's GameCube era helmed by the late Satoru Iwata to be its most fascinating when it came to experimental game design. Giving Mario a jetpack, making Metroid a first-person shooter, commanding small creatures in Pikmin, controlling Donkey Kong with a drum peripheral, you get the point. When it came to the Zelda title on the Purple Lunchbox, a game that had to follow up the monumental Ocarina of Time and the cult favorite Majora's Mask, Nintendo approached things a little differently. With a completely new visual style, an open sea world, and a vastly different tone as compared to previous titles, Nintendo would simultaneously release one of the best and contentious Zelda titles to date, the one, the only, The Wind Waker. Full disclosure, while I typically choose to record footage from the original game, I decided this time around I wanted to capture footage from the HD remake on the Wii U, partially because it's a superior version and partially because it's better on the eyes. Anything I'm about to say can be applied to both versions of the game. Zelda games are special in terms of what genre they fit into. They're not quite RPGs, not quite hack and slash, and not quite action games. They're a combination of a lot of mechanics, genres, and gameplay elements that make them as unique as they are fun. They're the quintessential adventure games in my opinion, and Wind Waker might just be the entry that exemplifies this the best. The overall sense of adventure on the high seas is why Wind Waker works so well for me. Wind Waker takes place years after Ocarina of Time. After Ganondorf was sealed away by Link, Ganon would eventually break free and present imminent danger to the world. Unfortunately for the people of Hyrule, the Hero of Time was nowhere to be found. Out of options, the gods flooded the land to prevent Ganon from taking over the world, forming what is now known as the Great Sea. While most Zelda games have Link become the anointed hero of the land and set off on his adventure from the start, in Wind Waker, Link's just a kid, living a lazy life on Outset Island with his grandma and his sister Errol. Link's world is turned upside down as pirates arrive on the island in pursuit of a massive bird carrying someone in its talons. That someone is Tetra, the captain of the pirates. The pirates manage to clip the bird, dropping Tetra into the woods above Outset Island. After rescuing her from some bacoblins, Link begins to head back home when the bird returns, capturing Errol and flying away. From there, it's up to Link to set out on the open waters and bring his sister back home. After attempting to rescue Errol, Link is thrust into the traditional Zelda affair, with collecting three orbs in order to access the Master Sword, collect the Triforce, save his sister, and Zelda, and defeat Ganon at the end. The story isn't revolutionary by any means, and it isn't anything new for Zelda, but I did find myself liking the characters more than anything, even Ganon. The reason why Era was kidnapped is that Ganon is aware of this whole reincarnation loop that Link, Zelda, and himself are trapped in. His plan was to round up every girl with pointy ears, inevitably capturing Zelda and gaining access to the Triforce of Wisdom, that eventually includes Tetra. Tetra's a really fun character, she's got this laid-back, smug attitude. She has this sassy sense of humor that just makes her interactions with Link or the rest of her crew fun to watch. She's such a fan favorite that she was added into the the Zelda Dynasty Warriors spin-off game, Hyrule Warriors. From a story standpoint, it's a great reveal that Tetra, oh yeah, spoiler alert for an 18-year-old game, by the way, is Zelda because it ties into Ganon's plan and why she was kidnapped in the first place. Unfortunately, the only big negative of Wind Waker's narrative is that after Tetra realizes she's Zelda, her personality and role in the story overall takes a 180 and kind of ruins both characters. She's redeemed a bit towards the end when she helps Link in the final battle. The King of Red Lions is probably second in terms of Zelda assistant characters, first being the ever-popular Midna. The King of Red Lions is your boat companion, and allows you to explore the Great Sea. The King of Red Lions also has a big reveal, similar to Tetra, as he is the spirit of the King of Hyrule that was flooded all those years ago. Medley and Makar are adorable and have neat little backstories about being sages and helping Link on his quest. They're also utilized in some neat ways in their respective dungeons for puzzle solving. And then there's the player character, Link. When designing the original Legend of Zelda for the NES, Shigeru Miyamoto stated that Link wasn't supposed to be his own character, rather he was meant to be the Link between the player and the game world. This philosophy carried on for several titles, but the Wind Waker being as unique as as it is, is where Link started to come into his own. He still has yet to actually speak, but Link is the most expressive he's ever been. Even without speech, Nintendo was able to tell so much with very little, giving Link fantastic facial animations and body language that spells out exactly how he feels in any situation. This makes Wind Waker Link, or Toon Link as he's referred to now, as one of the best incarnations yet. While the narrative isn't anything noteworthy, it has its moments while the characters drive the most of the enjoyment. But Nintendo games are never truly known for their stories because gameplay always takes precedent, and Zelda's gameplay is some of the best in the business. That sense of adventure Wind Waker exudes 
exudes from its setup and story is complemented by its gameplay. Since Breath of the Wild released, it changed what a Zelda game is, and while I loved it to death, didn't exactly scratch that classic Zelda itch I had. Zeldas are the epitome of adventure games, having the players explore a world full of villages or towns that house residents you can talk to, explore and fight through dungeons infested with enemies, collecting items, both active and passive, as well as currency, hearts, and magic. The formula is extremely effective and has been for nearly 30 years, from A Link to the Past to Skyward Sword. The reason why I believe Breath of the Wild had to change this formula was not because it doesn't work or isn't fun, but because too much of a good thing is still too much. Zelda's formula has always had a special place in my heart because it's not only fun, it's also expertly designed. While previous titles were relatively segmented adventures, Wind Waker is one of the first examples of a truly open world Zelda game. While Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask had open world aspects, it was mostly just a hub as the access to various towns or regions had Link loading into separate areas from the main Hyrule or Termina field. Wind Waker's Great Sea doesn't have these restrictions. The Great Sea is spectacular. There, I said it. Having the majority of the game take place on the open ocean was a stroke of genius in my opinion. One of the many criticisms of Ocarina, Majora, and even future titles like Twilight Princess is that their open worlds felt a bit barren, often with wide stretches of land to traverse with little to actually do. Same can be said for a lot of open world games, both past and present. Hyrule being flooded creates a more believable world in this case, as typically the ocean isn't filled to the brim with islands or land masses. That's not to say there's nothing to do on the high seas, far from it. There's always something off on the horizon that can pique your interest. Enemy rafts floating along that are carrying rupees or other collectibles you can plunder, glowing spots on the ocean's surface indicate treasure buried on the sea floor, there's all sorts of obstacles like octoroks, whirlwinds, pirate ships or watchtowers to avoid or take on, there's even a traveling merchant, the one and only beetle, who you can come across to buy or sell items. And of course, there are islands to explore as well. Exploring in the Wind Waker is the most rewarding out of any classic Zelda to date. The world still has the ever useful and addicting heart containers that increase your max health, but new to Wind Waker are treasure charts. Treasure charts are maps that give a central area in which treasure can be found on the Great Sea. These can be anything from heart pieces to rupees and are always fun searching out, using the chart in conjunction with your own map of the Great Sea. Filling out your sea chart I found to be something strangely addicting. It's that bit of completionist in me, I guess. Each sector of the map will have a fish leaping out of the sea. Spreading some bait nearby will have that fish stop and eat. As a thank you, he'll update your map of that sector. He'll also give you some helpful information about the surrounding islands, and even a clue or two as to how to progress. It's oddly fun to watch your map slowly fill in and adds to the adventure on the high seas theme Wind Waker goes for. To venture out on the Great Sea, you'll need more than just your gung-ho attitude. Sailing is your main source of transportation around the Great Sea. A major criticism of Wind Waker is that the sailing can be a bit boring. I personally find it to be wonderful. I've stated before I'm in the minority when it comes to open world games and traversal. I genuinely enjoy traveling around, taking in my surroundings, and really immersing myself in this world so many people spent hours of their lives crafting, and Wind Waker is no exception. Sailing your way towards your objective as the wind whips behind you, seagulls congregate and fly around your sail, the weather or time of day changing from a peaceful sunny morning to a dark and stormy night. Of course, a boat isn't like a horse or car, and if you're sailing against the wind, you're going nowhere. Wind plays a big part in the Wind Waker, as the title would suggest. Using the titular baton, players can perform various tasks like warping from place to place, controlling the mind of something or someone, and most importantly, affecting wind direction. Just like sailing, a large portion of people vehemently despise this mechanic, and then while I can understand their reasonings, it's something that I love. Small little mechanical touches like having to check your map out at sea, or changing the wind direction, adds tremendously to the overarching theme of adventure Wind Waker pulls off so well. When you set your course for a sector on your map you haven't searched yet, altering the wind and unfurling your sail as the Great Sea theme kicks in, there really isn't anything like it. <laughs> feeling of discovery as you explore this huge open world and uncover it piece by piece, sailing from island to island, meeting people and defeating enemies and saving the world, it's just a blast. Looking at the map, each sector here contains an island somewhere within it. Some are main islands where towns and dungeons are located, some contain side missions, while others offer various goodies to reward exploration. Some of the islands you'll discover house Zelda's main attraction, if you will dungeons. Dungeons or temples are my favorite part of Zelda games because they take Zelda's combat, exploration, and puzzle solving aspects and streamline them into a laser focused mega challenge of sorts. Wind Waker goes for the quality over quantity approach, having only six, not including Ganon's castle at the end. There's also several mini dungeons around the Great Sea, some of which are optional. Each of the Wind Waker's dungeons, just like typical Zelda games, has a unique style and atmosphere, usually focusing on an element, like Forest Haven's grass theme or the Wind Temple's focus on, well, wind. Each temple employs various gameplay mechanics within them. For 
For example, Dragon Roost Cavern has players using jugs of water to make platforms on top of the lava, Tower of the Gods has rising water levels and mind control, and the Forsaken Fortress has a stealth element to it. While each have their own unique theming and mechanics, they're all similarly designed. The beauty in Zelda's dungeons is in this singular room design technique. Each room a player enters within a dungeon gives the player everything they need to know and has the player figure out from there where they need to do. Puzzles are fairly simple, from defeating all the enemies in a room, to lighting a torch, to stepping on a switch. The fun is in taking in every aspect the room has to offer and stringing along each element until you reach the conclusion. Puzzles aren't mind-meltingly complex and they don't have to be. Zelda has a lot of moving parts in its gameplay repertoire, so entering a room could be a simple puzzle, a platforming section, a combat challenge, or some sort of combination. This is what gives exploring each dungeon its charm and enjoyment. You're always making progress and being rewarded for your efforts with every room you come across, whether that's solving puzzles to open doors, defeating enemies to uncover secret chests that house a map or compass for easier exploration, or finding keys to open up doors somewhere else in the dungeon. This constant and consistent feedback loop of entering a room, completing a various challenge, and getting some sort of reward is as fun as it is addicting. You only get so far in a dungeon until you realize you need something new to progress, and that's where items come into play. Zelda's dungeon design mentality is simple yet effective. Essentially, players will have all they need to progress about halfway through a dungeon. At that point, a mini boss of sorts will challenge the player, and upon defeating them, they'll be rewarded with an item, be it the bow and arrow or grappling hook. Up to that point, there were areas inaccessible to the player, but this newly acquired item, players can now access the rest of the dungeon all the way to the boss. It's textbook game design and I adore its intuitiveness. Wind Waker's items are probably the most creative and useful of the 3D Zelda titles. Items are versatile, being able to be used in combat as well as exploration. You have your traditional items like bombs or the bow and arrow, and you have your interesting ones like the Deku Leaf and the Grappling Hook. Bombs are effective against enemies as you probably can imagine, but their main use is to blow open walls or rocks leading to secret areas, extra goodies, or a path forward. Bombs can be used at sea as well, using them as your main line of defense against enemies on the open ocean. The bow and arrow is the most suited for combat, offering a longer range option which is especially effective against flying enemies. It can also be used to hit switches off in the distance, and comes equipped with fire and ice arrow variants, which can also be used for both puzzles and combat. The Deku Leaf gives Link the ability to glide as long as he has enough magic. It's used pretty effectively in various dungeons, specifically the Wind Temple, to traverse a landscape or solve puzzles. It can also be used to stun or push enemies away with a gust of wind. While it can be fun to use in the dungeons that prioritize it, experimenting out in the open world can be just as fun, gliding to areas once thought unreachable. The grappling hook is a neat little twist on the traditional hook shot. It's mostly used for swinging across gaps, you can also use it to pull switches or levers. While at sea, the grappling hook can be used to retrieve sunken treasure, and using it in combat can steal items off of enemies like rupees, joy pendants, or skull necklaces. The versatility in Zelda's items, Wind Waker's specifically, creates opportunities for unique encounters and problem solving. While their primary use in dungeons works well enough, it's utilizing them in the overworld that creates great replayability options. While they're useful in combat, items are not your first line of defense. Zelda's combat isn't complex by any means, employing traditional sword and shield play. Ocarina of Time pioneered the innovation of Z-targeting, which is now a staple of most third-person action games, and it works wonders. Targeting an enemy keeps Link locked to said enemy, allowing for 360 motion around them. There are a few different sword attacks players can pull off which can be useful or sometimes mandatory to defeat certain enemies. Tilting the analog stick forward performs a stab, moving it left to right initiates a horizontal slash, whereas letting the analog stick go makes Link do a vertical slash. Holding down the attack button can allow Link to perform a spin attack, which is most effective when there are multiple enemies around. Players also have the ability to block using Link's shield. It's as simple as holding the black button when the enemy swings at you. This can sometimes cause the enemy to lose their weapon, opening them up for a kill shot. The shield can also be used for deflecting projectiles and solving puzzles later on in the game with the mirror shield. New to Wind Waker is the ability to parry. I say ability, it's more or less a quick time event of sorts. Hitting the A button when the prompt flashes on screen allows Link to roll around the enemy or jump and avoid its attack, dealing a devastating blow. It's an additional tactic that's nice to utilize from time to time, but weaker enemies are dispatched easily enough, leaving parrying to be more useful on tougher enemies. Also new to the Wind Waker is the ability to pick up enemy weapons. It's a more robust mechanic than just combat, as commandeering enemy weaponry can be used to solve puzzles as well. This would be the first time until Breath of the Wild that enemy weaponry can be manipulated by the player. Using the various sword swings, blocking and parrying, as well as utilizing an enemy's weapon against them, all culminate in a simple yet effective combat system. If Zelda were a Devil May Cry, God of War, or Bayonetta-style hack and slash, this system would be subpar at best, but there's more than one cog in the machine that is Zelda, and it works well enough to keep the player engaged with simpler enemies and on their toes with tougher ones. There are smaller enemies that are easily dispatched, like flying keys or choo-choos. Enemies like Bokoblins are your typical threats, never being too difficult and having simple attack patterns. The bigger and uglier Moblins offer a bit more of a strategic fight, as they have a 
longer range, the ability to block, and landing their attack and send Link flying off if you're not careful. Ranged enemies like Wizrobes can teleport and fire magic projectiles, meaning dodging and taking them out with the bow and arrow when they let their guard down. There's a nightmare inducing Redeads that can stun Link, making him an easy target for nearby enemies. Larger enemies like Stalfos or Dark Nuts do the most damage, with Stalfos spinning a giant club around in an attempt to take Link out. Dark Nuts are the biggest challenge, outfitted with layers of armor players have to strip away to do damage. This is where parrying works the best, avoiding the massive sword lunge and cutting their armor off in one foul swoop. There's more where those came from, making Zelda's overworld and dungeons fun to fight through in tandem with its combat system. But the biggest baddies you'll face down come in the form of bosses. Like I stated earlier, dungeons end in a climactic battle with its boss. Just like the dungeons they inhabit, these bosses utilize the item found within. They're almost like a puzzle in and of themselves, reading their patterns and knowing when to use that specific item or items to open up their weak point and hit them with a flurry of attacks. My favorites have to be Godon from the Tower of the Gods, the Helmarok King from the Forsaken Fortress, and the last bout with Ganondorf. One of the aspects I genuinely love about the Wind Waker is just how bizarre it is even for a Zelda game. Talking boats, wind gods in the form of frogs, the Rito, a bird slash human hybrid species, Tingle, there's this girl who has like Stockholm Syndrome and is in love with a mob. There's a pair that Link can use to take control of seagulls for some reason. Puppet Ganon, uh, Tingle, again. Its tone is so silly and out there, which adds to its overall charm. Charming is the best word to use to describe Wind Waker's visual presentation. While it was a point of contention at launch, it's clear Wind Waker is simply one of the most beautiful games ever made, and that's solely due to its art style. While Wind Waker didn't create the cel shaded art style, it definitely popularized it. The cartoony and oddly proportioned geometry, the simple yet expressive characters, the hand-drawn nature of the particle effects, the bright and colorful palette, everything comes together remarkably for one of the most timeless art styles ever. The Wind Waker looked amazing in 2002 and retained its beauty with the HD remake in 2013 and will continue to look great in the future. Same thing goes for Wind Waker's soundtrack, which I would say is the best in the series in my opinion. It has this sort of Celtic vibe to it, ranging from strange to calming to adventurous. Just like the rest of the game, it's unique and tremendous, with standout tracks like the aforementioned Great Sea theme, Dragon Roost Island, Mulgara's boss theme. After the mega success of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, Nintendo could have easily rested on their laurels and pumped out another similar Twilight Princess-esque game to appease the masses. Instead, the team over at Nintendo turned everything upside down. With a radical new art style and an entire ocean to explore, Nintendo wasn't afraid to get weird, to get creative. While The Wind Waker isn't perfect, it exemplifies the best of Nintendo's experimental phase during the GameCube era. It's a beautiful, swashbuckling adventure for the ages, and a standout entry in a legendary series.